Hi class, today's lecture is going to be on lipids. You can say lipids or you can say fats. And there are also oils, there are saturated fats, there are triglycerides, there are uh, phospholipids, there is a cholesterol, there is unsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and so on. Uh, omega-3, omega-6, long-chain fatty acids, short-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fatty acids, medium-chain triglycerides. So there is a lot. So, and if you think that fat does make you fat, I hope by the end of this lecture, you will know that this is not a true. If you think that fat will make you fat, it can make you sick, but probably not fat. All right. So what you see here on the screen is a triglycerides. Tri means three. Diglyceride two, monoglyceride one. So this is a triglyceride. This is a fatty fatty acid number one, fatty acid number two, and fatty acid number three. This is a glycerol molecule that holds uh, glycerol, glycerol molecule that uh, holds on on those uh, fatty acids. So when we are digesting, and usually we eat triglycerides in the form of animal products, so when we're digesting this type of fat, your body will separate one fatty acid, then another fatty acid, and then another fatty acid. We're going to look at that, but right now at the beginning of the lecture, I just want to basically explain the functionality. So basically what happens is, um, is that, right, we already look at this type of uh, structures, right? So there's fat digestion and then there is a fat absorption so the first stage happens in the oral cavity by the lipases right lipase which is an enzyme so we can look at this in pretty simple way so in the oral cavity there's a separation of one fatty acid then in in the stomach that's what get in there right so now it's a diglyceride let's say then in the stomach another lipase like gastric gastric lipase here was like oral or lingual oral lipase or lingual or salivary there are so many names i would stay with lingual or salivary lipase so here in the stomach, um, gastric lipase will separate another fatty acid. So here was separated, now it's free. And then here it's separated, now it's free. And then the small intestine, pancreatic lipase, right, uh, separates the last one. So now it's another fatty acid. So the three, three free fatty acids, now they are free fatty acids, from the small intestine would be absorbed into the blood. So that's basically what happens uh, in kind of three stages. However, there is uh, there are some exceptions, there's some complexity because at the beginning of the lecture, remember I said that we have a variety of different types of fats. So they actually being processed and absorbed and digested differently. So, but we're going to try to concentrate the most common one, which is a triglyceride, and we consume fats usually, uh, if I would put, in, put it in percentage, 90% of, of fat we consume in the form of triglycerides when they're attached. So your body separates them and they're free fatty acids. So we can show them on paper in uh, textbooks, either in this type of form, like this, right? That's where the carbons are. Or we can show them like that straight with the straight line, which is the same thing. Also, you see there's one line here, but also there's a, like a double line. So it's a double bond and here's just a single bond. So this is a single and this is a uh, double, double bond. And here there could be more than one double bond. So, and that's how we categorize, um, that's how we categorize these uh, types of fats. And that's how we can differentiate one from another. So you see this, like one single line, we call it saturated. 
if there is a double line which is the double bond so it is an unsaturated so there also could be trans fatty acids where the hydrogens you see these hydrogens on one side scratchy and there are hydrogens on opposite sides so that's been trans uh, it's been hydrogenated like hydro hydrogenated oils which could be kind of dangerous trans fats hydrogenated fats are kind of dangerous they lead to accumulation of plaque um, can lead to atherosclerosis heart attack um, type 2 diabetes uh, heart attack um, stroke so these are the types of, um, of fats so as I already said fats are kind of fairly 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 complicated subject and we have a lot to go through all right so uh, during this lecture during this lecture I will ask a few questions uh, for one of my particular class and uh, that you will have to answer for extra points you don't answer you don't get those extra points but it's pretty cool to get those extra points all right so you have to watch the entire lecture to answer that question so characteristics of lipids they're hydrophobic because they're afraid of water that's what we call them hydrophobic they're afraid of water uh, so there are fats there are oils right so when you say lipids when you say lipids it is either a fat or it is either an oil we used to call it fats 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 but like oh you look at the oil and you call it a fat yes it is a fat but more proper terminology would be lipid because lipid includes both fats and oils so for to be more technical fats are solid like butter and oils are liquid like oils like any type of oils that you have in your kitchen olive oil avocado oil safflower oil oils and you see they're kind of different this is just a picture with another type of uh, arrangement that they put on, uh, on images but then you see you see there's that's uh, let me use yellow yeah you see like this lines right here and at the end of the each line there's a carbon i'll talk about carbon briefly and you'll see other images and here the same thing but there's like a kink right so when there's a kink it is a bend kink so there's a bending so where there's a bend it means that there's extra line so that adds a bond double bond because carbons they attached one to another with the bond and that's important to understand this bonding so then it's going to be very easy for you to understand the the science of fats trust me it would be very easy so that's why we have to look at a little bit of chemistry where there is no double bonds fats are straight right like this so it's easy to pack them you see the molecules are really packed near one one another and that's why at the at the one thing I forgot to mention at the room temperature fats are solid at the room temperature and liquids and oils are liquid also at the room temperature so the room temperature 72 so 74 degrees once this temperature changes obviously if the temperature will go high hypothetically let's say 80 uh, or let's say 90 degrees right the bottle but but uh, the but butter <laughs> butter will start melting and if you put oil in the freezer and you will put like a very low temperature oils will get solidified maybe not maybe yes it depends on the type of oil depends on the bonding and depends on the temperature we'll look at this as well today at the room temperature so triglycerides why triglycerides because it's easier for fats to stay in these arrangements right fatty acid fatty acid fatty acid and this glycerol molecule that holds them so there are triglycerides there are also phospholipids that are diglycerides they have two fatty acids then there is a sterols like co less terol molecules a little bit different chemical arrangements and there are fat soluble vitamins 
We will talk about vitamins later in the lectures in the course. So there are fat soluble vitamins and there are water soluble vitamins like B complex vitamins are water soluble. They will be absorbed into the blood and they'll be, they will be delivered to liver or whatever your body needs where they need to go. And the fat soluble vitamins, they need a transporter. They need to be carried out in, um, in the blood and in the lymph. We'll look at that towards the end of the lecture. So as I already mentioned that in the beginning of the lecture that uh, there are varieties of fats. So there are saturated fats, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. So this group of fats, this group of fats called unsaturated. So what is the saturation? So let's do this. So let's say you have a, um, I would rather, I would rather lose, an, uh, yeah. What is saturation? So let's say carbon has four possible attachments to it. So if all of these sites are taken, it means that this carbon, this essential carbon around which there are four attachments, it means that this carbon is completely saturated. It's like a person and only has a two hands, right? So on one side, there is another person holds hands on this side. And this is essential, right? Let's say essential. And there is another person also holds this person in the middle. So this person is completely saturated. Well, unless you can lose, use legs, right? Legs to legs, whatever. So it's saturated. So, for example, if, if this side is empty and there is nothing on this side, it means unsaturated. I'm exaggerating. Unsaturated. So, similar thing with carbons. Well, yes, I use the people, right? So, similar thing, let's say, let's look here. So, carbon, 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 that's how the fat looks like. Right on both sides, there's hydrogens, there's something else. So let's say also carbon. So you see, this essential carbon is saturated on four sides. This carbon is saturated on four sides. But what if there is a double bond? Right, there's hydrogen, hydrogen, but there's nothing on the other side. Nothing. So this means that this carbon is not saturated, or you can call it unsaturated. There's more to it. I don't want to get into the chemistry. There is more to it. So you see, uh, let me raise this so it's easier to see. You see this arrow pointing here to the double bond. So, and there are no hydrogens on, on this side. So that represents uh, that this, the, uh, those carbons are unsaturated. So they not, uh, the entire fatty acid, this one, is unsaturated. Just because there is one single double bond one one single double bond that fat is mono unsaturated mono is one double bond here there are two double bonds so now you can safely say that it's poly unsaturated you would think if it's one mono unsaturated if it's two uh, die no with with fats it is if it's two or more so two or more or like this two or more or like that two or more then it is a polysaturate polyunsaturated fats so they are unsaturated and that's what gives them uh, a different chemical properties and that's what will give them a uh, state of matter. And the state of matter, I mean by at the room temperature, one will be solid and another would be liquid. So if there are single bonds, which is a saturated fatty acid, because all the carbons are, satur all carbons are saturated and there are no double bonds, so that will give the property of being a solidified at the room temperature. If there are double bond, at least one so that and and will give a kink 
it means that the fats cannot pack uh, molecules of fats cannot pack uh, uh, neatly one uh, one close to one another right so it is re really hard to stay uh, near each other so that's why that will give a liquid form in organic chemistry so if there are more than two double bonds then uh, that particular oil would be more liquid dish it will take more negative temperature to make this oil solidify so hypothetically if there is one double bond and you will take this oil and you will put like in minus i don't know minus 10 celsius it will become semi-liquid it will be liquidish but you will see that it's already starting to solidify but if there is like uh pollen saturate fats that have double bonds or three double bonds you need to bring this fat or this oil you see i'm using fat this oil into minus 40 celsius in order to actually solidify or even lower I think that I'm not really sure but I think that antifreeze in the cars that they put in the winter work on the same principle maybe it's something different but uh, works on the same principle maybe maybe not if you want to find out let me know not extra points for that but um, so pollen saturated more than two monon saturated one double bond and saturated that's only uh, only one single bond um, all right also also there is a length so there are short chain so you can say like that short chain fatty acids medium chain fatty acids or you can say medium chain triglycerides because they are tri they, they could be triglycerides right three of them or long chain fatty acids so also when we jump to the first image right so this looks like let me raise this to clean this up so this fat looks like uh, looks like it is a uh, long chain fatty acid let's count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16. that's the definition of a long chain fatty acid however the triglyceride could come like this like that so it would be short chain fatty acid triglyceride short chain triglyceride or it could be like here right here so it would be medium chain fatty acid or you can call it medium chain triglycerides why triglycerides because as we already mentioned that uh, that the triglycerides this is in the form in this is in which form they come into our system and that's how we found them that's how we find them in animal products or the plant products in the form of triglycerides obviously there are other forms that I mentioned right in the beginning of the lectures lecture triglycerides uh, mono triglycerides diglycerides um, uh, cholesterols short long medium they come in different forms phospholipids and so on so why length why length is important length of fatty acids will uh, affect it will affect chemical properties of the fat their arrangements functionality the way they will function in your body and solubility so we just said it before uh, that um, fats are hydrophobic here hydrophobic they afraid of water however if the fats are short chain fatty acids or even medium all of them are short here even medium chain triglycerides they could be water soluble and they can go directly into the blood and they will be absorbed through blood usually fats are not absorbed through blood they packed in uh, micelles or chylomicrons like a bus that delivers them somewhere we will look at that transportation of fats uh, at the end of the lecture towards the end of the lecture so it depends on their solubility so if they're really small so they will be absorbed in the blood and they will be used up for energy so that's also important because if they're long 
chain fatty acids and we consume them and they usually come from animal products they will be stored but if we're consuming fats from plant products and they are in their form of being short chain fatty acids or even medium chain fatty acids up to eight carbons most likely they will be used for energy right away instead of being stored so now you can look at uh, health uh, from the health perspective so i would rather have in my diet uh, short chain fatty acids or medium chain triglycerides because they will go for energy i don't want to store them i want to use them for energy why would i want to store them even fat doesn't make you fat but i do not really want to store them because that's another that's another lesson we will look at that so triglycerides so this is a triglyceride you see this triglyceride you can probably guess that this triglyceride because there are only single double bond do not pay attention to these double bonds on this side because this is a glycerol molecule that holds on those fatty acids so just because there are no double bonds i can call this saturated fatty acid all carbons are saturated on all sides it could be combination one fatty acid could have double bond another fatty acid might not have double bonds at all and another fatty acid might have like let's say two double bonds just because they will be ripped apart through the digestion so this will become this one this will become free fatty acid has a double bond so this one would be mono unsaturated fatty acid you can call it mufa mono unsaturated fatty acid this one would be free fatty acid but it is a saturated fatty acid because there are no double bonds and this one could be also free fatty acid and we can call it just because there are two double bonds we can call it poly more uh, poly many poly unsaturated fatty acids and we call it pufa pufa mufa sfa I never heard SFA, I've heard saturated fatty acids, I tried to come up with something, didn't work out, doesn't sound good. So, MUFA and PUFA. So, by the rule of thumb, thumb, usually, right, so let me erase that, usually fats that are saturated fats, it's always, it is always usually, it is never always always in science, right? So usually when there's a saturated fats, they are coming from animals. And when there are unsaturated fats, they usually comes from plant products. Most plant products will have the double bond. They will be polyunsaturated fats or monounsaturated fats, oils. Most of the oils, I'm saying most of the oils usually most of the oils are coming from plant i never seen a oil that comes from an animal maybe there is one interesting all right so oils are plant unsaturated some of the carbons atoms hydrogen atoms four double bonds and don't have as many hydrogen atoms as possible right so not important so you see this is a saturated fats completely fat and this on the first page right on the first page what do we see this is a triglyceride and this is a triglyceride. This is a altogether. It's just just a triglyceride, but this free fatty acid saturated fat. If we will rip this apart, this one will be mufa. And if we will rip rip this one apart, this would be pufa. Why? Because there's more than two double bonds. You can show it in this arrangement, like with the uh, like that because that's how they actually look under microscope that's the their actual arrangement we just to to save space in the paper um, we just put them like with a straight line um, right and this is a glycerol molecule that can be used for by the way can be used for conversion into sugar so your body can this take this glycerol glycerol molecule and convert it into sugar not a pretty good uh, conversion, not a straight conversion, but they could be converted into fat. So when some people say that fats cannot be converted to sugar, yes, they cannot be converted to sugar, but this molecule, because fats are this, this, these are the fats. This is just something that carries them around. 
so the fats cannot be converted back into sugar how can you well, well that's uh, organic chemistry so clear on that I hope um, and hide I have a few slides that are hiding all right so triglycerides roles in the body so what is the role of a triglyceride in the body um it could be a structural fats could be used to build something or it could be used for energy so structural and energy structural your body using fats to build a lot of molecules like hormones steroid hormones enzymes um like let's say cholesterol is being used for ligands ligands like a receptors on the cells so structural and uh can be used for energy muscles prefer fatty acids for energy your heart can use uh, fat for energy or even prefers uh, brain would like to use some fat for energy so in the metabolism lecture we will look at that more precisely but this is what we're going to look at it for now so let's look at the lipolysis or lipolysis so lipases you already know what the lipases so the lipases are the enzymes that splits or break down these bonds here to separate glycerol away from fatty acids so this is a triglyceride all of them are saturated fatty acids and when they're going to be ripped apart they will be ripped like with the long right and it is a long chain fatty acid right so they will become free fatty acid free fatty acid and free fatty acid and they will be utilized by our body how maybe we will talk about that now maybe in other probably in another lectures in metabolism so what is lipolysis so the lipolysis is the process of breaking down fats right breaking down triglycerides into fatty acids or i would say free fatty acids and glycerol and this catalyzed by this enzyme lipase um acids from glycerol and dietary triglycerides so there's another another uh another molecule hormone sensitive lipase that's an enzyme that breaks down or goes to the hydrolysis hydrolysing remember the water participates in separation um, if you want a refresher on what hydrolysis by the way so you can go to uh, nutrition in you and look for one of the study guide uh, the share note that I created on um, looking for hydrolysis so it is somewhere a uh, solvent solution osmosis colloid hypotonic so it is somewhere here so look at the hydrolysis uh, I don't see it right now but but it's uh, it is somewhere here all right uh, so it is when water enters and start uh, separating molecules together with enzymes so hydrolysis of as rather attached fatty acids of the glycerol from a deposit tissue so pretty simple hormone sensitive lipase is a similar to a lipases but there is a difference and that's what I want you to pay attention because one of the questions that I will ask I will ask a few questions one of the questions that I will ask would be probably on this somewhere so I would put slide number four question All right, so let me explain you something. When triglycerides coming from food, mm, I'll jump here. Yeah. So let's say we're having food, right? And it comes from a product, animal product, plant product, right? Triglycerides. So they come in this form, and then there is a lipases, lipase. Or lipases starts breaking down lingual lipase uh, gastric lipase lipase and pancreatic lipases strips this fat apart so now it's free fatty acid free fatty acid and free fatty acid so that one ends up in the blood right and from blood 
let's say it will get into the storage, right? Let's say bypass everything and boom, it is stored in adipose, uh, adipose tissue. Tissue. So adipose tissue, it's, uh, these are the, our, our fat cells that holds on on that. So when these free fatty acids cannot be used directly for energy, it could not be used for building something, they will be stored and they will be stored again in the form of triglycerides. Your body will take these free fatty acids, let's say it takes these free fatty acids and attaches them back. So they will be here again, like this, attached, right? From poly to mono, and again to poly. Remember, similar arrangements to carbohydrates, to, uh, to proteins, similar process. So triglycerides from food being broken down into the free fatty acids, and then they will be stored again in, uh, 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 in the form of triglycerides. It is easier to control them that way in, in fatty, uh, in adipose tissue. So, but when your body needs, and the lipases, by the way, lipases breaks this down, right? So they, they act on those bonds and they separate those bonds. So when your body needs these triglycerides, again, for energy, for structural purposes, for whatever reason, so your body will take these triglycerides, right, and break them down into the free fatty acids. So on this side, it is a lipases enzymes, enzymes, lipases, and on this side, it is this uh, hormone-sensitive lipase that will be responsible to break down the triglycerides like this triglyceride into the free fatty free fatty acid hormone sensitive lipase so this is an i'm sorry exogenous from the outside this is the exogenous triglyceride and this triglyceride is called endogenous. And there are a lot of misconceptions and mistakes that people make when they talk about triglycerides and they say, well, the cause of the disease is the triglycerides that we eat. Mm, the cause of the disease is the triglycerides that we produce. Well, not produce, we store them and then your body breaks them down and those actually triglycerides that were stored before and then they were broken down and then they end up, let's say, again in the blood, that those triglycerides that cause a problem. So, and we call them endogenous because you absorb them because not only triglycerides can be stored as fat, not only triglycerides that can be stored as fat, also sugar, why am I not getting my color? Also, sugar can be stored as triglyceride. And then when your body needs energy, it will break down triglycerides. It will break down triglycerides into the free fatty acids. It's not going to be able to break down triglycerides back into the sugar. Yes, you eat processed, processed products sugar, even uh, even amino acids, even proteins. And if it's too much of them, your body will store them as triglycerides. Once it's stored as triglycerides, there is no way it can come back on something else. So your body will break it down into the free fatty acids. They will, they will end up in blood and that can cause a atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic plaques. So this type of triglycerides, we call them endogenous, inside internally and this they would they are coming are called exogenous so that's kind of a major difference so on this side lipase breaks down triglycerides into the free fatty acids and on this side internally uh hormone sensitive hormone sensitive hormone sensitive lipase break down the triglycerides into free fatty acids. You cannot say that the lipase breaks down internal. Hormone sensitive lipase breaks down uh, endogenous um, triglycerides into free fatty acids. Um, Catalyze hydrolysis of ester bonds and attach fatty acids to the glycerol molecule, uh, molecule from adipose tissue. 
And there is a little bit different arrangement. I don't really want to discuss that. Mono, dye, and triglycerides, right? So this is a triglyceride. So you can look at another type of arrangement. This is the glycerol molecule. That's the actual ester linkage that there's something else that also holds them. And then those, those free fatty acids, right? Like this, or this one could be like this and so on, da. right? So we call the mona or pufa. So they could be combination of any as you've seen it here on the first image. Also, we can show them this way, free fatty acid, triglycerides, how many free fatty acids and triglycerides, three, phospholipids, we'll look at phospholipids towards the end of the lecture. So the phospholipids mostly are used up by um, cell, the part of the cell membrane. We have 37, 40, 50, 60 trillions of cells in human body. And all cells have those five phospholipids. And cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol Easter. Uh, so that's the symbol for the cholesterol, like a diamonds. Sugar, right? So resembles a molecule of sugar, this one, right? This one, not really sugar, but your body is able to make cholesterol from sugar. So classification of lipids. So this slide, slide number seven, basically, basically summarizes everything that what we covered so far. Carbon to carbon bonds, which is influenced the physical and nature appearance of fatty acids, right? So saturated fats, single carbon to carbon bond and solid. Unsaturated fats, under the unsaturated fats, what? We have one unsaturated MUFA and we have polyunsaturated PUFA. One double bond here and it gives the kink. And you see hydrogens on one side. That's important to pay attention to. Hydrogens on one side. And polyunsaturated fats, PUFAs, more than two double bonds. And they're liquid. Also, hydrogens on, on, on both sides, on, on one side, not on the opposite. You will see why that's important. Classification of lipids, any, uh, it's again and again and again, single bond, double bond. Um, they pack, pack into a hard fat and will not pack neatly, so they are stay liquid, this one, double bonds, just because of the arrangements of the bonding, right? So that's why it looks like this. And with the double bond, right? So it's a kink here, right? Whatever, carbon. So... Let's look at the examples of saturated fats that we call them are kind of dangerous, right? Saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. So let's look at the food products. Coconut oil. And it's mostly, it doesn't really mean that the triglyceride, and you can call it, you say coconut oil, it's a triglyceride, it has only saturated fats. No, that's not the truth. Because if I will slide down all the way to the bottom, and we have a lot to go all the way here. Where is it? And you see at the distribution of fats, right? Let's say coconut oil. You see this blue stands for saturated fats. Red, MUFA. So this is MUFA. MUFA, and whatever this color is, I, I think it's green, it's PUFA. But the mostly coconut oil is made out of saturated fats. And there's some of MUFA and some, there's some of PUFA. So if it's mostly of saturated fats, uh, yeah, people can say that this type of triglyceride is a mostly saturated fats. But why coconut oil is healthy? Because coconut oil's saturated fats are medium chain triglycerides and most likely they will be used for energy instead of being stored so that's that's what it is here it doesn't show you if there is a long chain fatty acid short chain fatty acid but it just gives you perspective that all of the lipids they have varieties of three saturated fats monounsaturated fats or polyunsaturated fats 
Um, this is also another example. Saturate, monosaturate, omega-3, omega-6. We didn't discuss that, but we will discuss this uh, close towards the end of the lecture. All right. Um, so coconut oil, palm kernel, uh, kernel oil, uh, chocolate, saturated. But then again, combin I'm sorry, I have two cameras here. So let me remove one camera because I'm keep look looking at that camera. I'm switching cameras. I'm playing around with cameras. After all, I'm an ex graphics designer, photographer, videographer. So, um, like this technology all right so it was a long time ago when i was young right so saturated fats um right cheese right animal products remember mostly if you know that the product comes from the animal or it is an animal product, then most likely it is a saturated fat. And the coconut oil is just like an exception. It is a good exception because again, like I want to jump back here. Where is it? Here. Because you see, most of the oils that comes from plant have a little bit of saturated fats. They have a little bit of one bonds, right? Most of them have either double bonds or more than two double bonds. So they are plants mostly. So by looking at the plant and having this picture in your brain kind of visually, you will know, okay, so if this is a plant, so mostly there is low unsaturated fats, which could be dangerous, we will look at that, why it is more dangerous, and there are more of poly or monosaturated fats, then it is a lot healthier. Like you see olive oil, why everybody is obsessed about olive oil, because it has a lot of, of monounsaturated fats, which is healthy, which is liquid, and that liquid form and the solid form that what we can relate to our health or the disease progress. Probably should have bring these two slides up on top. Um, so you can look at that on your own. We don't really have to go through, but you understand, right? You understand the principle. So saturated fats and unsaturated fats Again, this is the same thing. I just leave it here so you can visualize and look at that. The double bond, two double bonds. Again, that's the saturated fats. It is a long fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, uh, acid, long chain fatty acid. This is a free fatty acid because it's one, right? So by itself, obviously it's attached to something, but um, fatty acids can have different chain length. We already know that. So medium chain, it is eight long chain it is 16 um so and the short chain fatty acids somewhere up to six right short chain um this is not the short chain um so now let's look at that dangerous one trans fat trans fats or hydrogenated fats you see it says hydrogens are on the opposite sides of the fatty acids backbone so we see in this type of arrangement which is we already we already learned that if there's a double bond so that that's where the kink is so and the hydrogens on one side here on the trans fats that are hydrogenated oils that are man-made in the factories in order to protect their products because trans fats or hydrogenated oils they are shelf stable they do not easily uh, melt they do not really leak out so you can put them on a the shelf you go in the grocery store in the summer you open the door you close the door open the door close the door that's the kind of danger zone and those candies or whatever whatever those products they almost do not really melt why because most of them they have hydrogenated fats they have trans fats even though it says zero there's a possibility that there are trans fats i will explain how 
So you see the arrangements on both sides, hydrogen, so that's what makes this fat to be stable. And you see it is a straight line, which is resembles saturated fats, even though there is a double bond. Double bond. So this is a man-made. So if you look at the package and, and you look at the, nutritional, uh, at the nutritional facts in the back on the pack and it says trans, there are trans, there are saturated fats, uh, they can also label polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and if it says that trans fatty acids are zero, zero, it doesn't really mean that it's zero, zero, unless if you look further into ingredient list, an ingredient list will say hydrogenated oils. If, it's, if on a nutritional label it says zero, zero, but in the ingredient list it says hydrogenated oils, it means that in the reality it is at least 0 0.5 of trans fats. And they are allowed by the FDA to do that. Because if it's 0 0.5, they are allowed to say that it's zero. It's kind of insignificant for health. But if you constantly consume that sneaking bar, sneaker bar, constantly, con I'm not really sure of the sneaker bar. I don't remember. I had to look at the pack. Any type of your favorite chocolates, products, chips, whatever, cereal. If it says trans and then it says hydrogenated oil, 0 0.5, then there is... Uh, zero, zero, not really zero, zero, zero point five. And if you constantly consume those products on daily basis, decade after decade, you will accumulate those trans fatty acids and they can cause these plaques, atherosclerotic plaques in your blood vessels. However, if on the ingredient list there is none, then whatever it says on the nutritional label, everything is in the back. We will look at the nutritional labels in other lectures and I will bring this back. If there is none, then there, and the trans says zero, then it's zero, zero. Sometimes they even put in trans fats, it's like uh, numbers, right? Like 1.0, for example. Dangerous do not pick up those products. So uh, once I learn the, the process, so I never get those products. And some people using that, oh, it's trans, it's zero, all right? That's dangerous because it still could be hydrogenated oil. Because it acts as a... Um, sure, uh, saturated fats, but it's called oil. All right, so cis arrangement, trans arrangement, cis means on one side and trans on the opposite side. Um, all right, let's proceed. Um, that's another interpretation image. Uh, you don't have to look at that. So packing. How are fats packing in our system? Triglycerides can pack a lot better than carbohydrate. Remember this from carbohydrate lecture. This is a glycogen. This is a glycogen. So you see the arrangement? Star, it is harder to pack. That's why we cannot store a lot of glycogen in our system. We can store like what? Half a pound in our liver, a little bit more in our muscles. So we constantly need energy when we exercise because during exercise, glycogen, glucose would be a prefer energy. But when it comes to fats, just because of this arrangement, we can pack them like brick on top of the brick on top of the brick. Perfect. Um, Names and food sources of some important fatty acids. Yes, let's skip that. This little dude, remember, this is just a general knowledge. Sometimes I stop because the general knowledge will only strengthen your knowledge, but usually I'm skipping on that. So there are also, also, also other types of fats. Linoleic and linolenic, but the names that you better to remember are omega omega 6 this w it is an omega omega 3 fatty acids and you probably heard a lot of, of, of omega 3 fatty acids so omega 3 fatty acids are very important to keep us healthy very healthy so where do we get omega 3 from all of it however foods uh, like let's say plant products when you're consuming them they also come in combination of two 
because omega-6 needs to balance omega-3 and omega-3 needs to balance omega-6 especially in our system so there is a tug of war between omega-6 and omega-3 and and whatever one is uh, is winning uh, that will reflect in your health and today omega-6 is winning and it is bad it is really bad that omega-6 is winning even though omega-6 on its own is good uh but just because of the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 omega-6 becomes a bad guy so i will explain it why so 18 carbons 18 carbons uh, cis double bond cis double bond which is good not a trans fat so remember omega-3 and omega-6 we uh we we will getting there so and we call those omega-3 and omega-6 essentials fatty acids like there's uh, essentials proteins right uh, or essentials amino acids uh, and same thing with essentials fatty acids so the metabolism of essential fatty acids so uh, eicosanoids not important you have to remember this name assist so why do we need essential fatty acids like omega-3 omega-6 assist in the regulation of immune and cardiovascular system act as a chemical messengers so what do they really do by like assist regulate immune and cardiovascular system so omega-3 and omega-6 so this omega-6 actually increase blood pressure right so it constricts constricts blood vessels and omega-3 dilates so it decreases blood pressure so dilates blood vessels so we need both even though omega-6 is bad kind of today but omega-3 is is good right so omega-3 decreases blood pressure because it dilates blood vessels and omega-6 increases blood pressure because it constricts blood vessels and we need both for the control but this one is winning just because of our diet we're gonna look at our diet so everything that you see here on this side it comes from omega-3 but there are some omega-6 as well but there is just a combination it is just um, in percentage wise right so also we use those essential fatty acids uh, for uh, hormones for enzymes but mostly hormones not mostly but both hormones enzymes and other structural molecules so um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture that fats are used for energy and uh, for the structural purposes to build cells and out of those cells your body is able to build tissue and out of the tissue organs and so far and and so far so also there are prostaglandins so the prostaglandins are other regulatory molecules that control dilation and constriction of blood vessels and they are produced at the site sites of uh, injury injury they produce at the sites of injury do we need them yes of course we need them and they regulate blood pressure they usually increase blood pressure if they are produced at the sites of injury they need to increase blood pressure to bring all those nutrients all those white blood cells uh, platelets what if there is a cut right if your body is injured and there is a laceration and it destroys blood vessels so the blood pressure might drop so your body is trying to uh, mm, recruit other blood vessels to bring uh, to bring more blood to bring more soldiers to fight that uh, problem so the prostaglandins are basically are increasing blood pressure and prostaglandins if I'm not mistaken they are coming from uh, um, they are made from omega-6 uh, omega-6 fatty acids so for this class just remember that right because this explains everything on top so all right so the reason i have that chemical formula just to point out something important because sometimes even though it's general knowledge sometimes students uh, get confused you see omega-6 that we said was saying that it's bad today today thousand years ago it was not bad maybe even 300 years ago omega-6 was still good maybe even 200 or 150 years ago is still because we had less of processed foods but 
this is the omega side. This is the omega side. So omega-6, it's called not just due to uh, amount of uh, double bonds, but just because this first double bond sits on the six carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six. It just happened that in this arrangement, right, so the linoleic acid omega-3 has three double bonds. So this number three has nothing to do with the amount of double bonds, and this number six has nothing to do with the amount of double bonds. It's just where the first double bond appears, appears on the third carbon. Some people would think, well, omega-6 is great because it probably has six double bonds. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, another, like, that's me, whatever, somewhere, stick it, six. No, it's not. It's just where the first carbon, first double bond originates. So that's why it's been called omega-3 and omega-6. And omega-3 has three double bonds, which makes this polyunsaturated fat to be in more liquid form. So it can, it can this particular fat can withstand harsh environments of negative temperature. Because remember, one double bond saturated fats at room temperature, it will be still solid. Two dub one double bond like mono unsaturated fats, maybe minus 10, then pollen saturated fats, two double bond, even lower, three double bonds, even, even, even lower temperature. And that's what is important for our health, to have those pollen unsaturated fats, the more double bonds they have, and they usually come from plant products, to consume them because they are important for our health and that's the next few slides and we'll you'll see why but right all right so uh building blocks for longer chain fatty acids right so an omega-3 and omega-6 are being used as the structural molecules to build even longer f uh chain fatty acids so this uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think there are 18 carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18. And this is 18. So out of this, your body is able to make even longer chain fatty acids, like 20 carbon or like 22 carbon, that are very important. So converting linoleic or linolenic, this is the linolenic acid, um, into longer chain fatty acids. So, and how it's done, it's done through the elongation, adding more carbons, your body's adding more carbons and making those fats longer. And what's very important and interesting, desaturation. Because if it's saturated, to desaturate, it will give another double bond. It will give another double bond. So that makes oil healthier in your system. So out of this, and they are building blocks, omega-3 and omega-6. Your body is able, that's why they're called essential fatty acids. Your body is able to make longer chain fatty acids with more double bonds that are uh, participate in health uh, related functions in your system. We'll look at those functions. Um, I will probably skip on this one, but that's basically desaturation and elongation. You see that you begin with uh, omega-3. This N also represents which carbon it begins on, right? It's like N, uh, where is it? Like N3, N3, because it begins in the N, on, on the third carbon. That's another nomenclature type of explanation. So where do we get, where do we get PUFAs, right? from flax seeds, from soybean oils. So you, we can get uh, from hemp seed oil, from algae, from fish, from fish, from fish, from algae, from fish, from fish, from fish, from fish. Omega-3 comes from animal products, but fish animal products. So that's why when we say that fish is crazy important, crazy important, that's what we mean by that. If you can understand that, and there are double bonds, and it makes more flexible, that oil is flexible, and that oil will be part of our cell membrane, that omega-3 will be part of the cell membrane, let's say red blood cell. So that red blood cell is gonna be less stiff, it's gonna be more flexible, so it would be a lot easier for the red blood cells to make tight corner in our capillaries. 
There is a research, inconclusive research, for what I'm saying right now, there's still debate on if it really does a mega threes or a mega six, mega threes actually, making our tissues flexible rather than stiff. There's a research, there's inconclusive research, there's still research, there's still debate. And I have something from, from that research, there's on slide 27. So it's like omega-3 that will become part of the uh, red blood cell um, uh, lipid membrane and that makes more flexible. So it is very easier for blood cells to make those tight corners in our, in our system. Um, however, when I was an undergrad, Yes, I was an undergrad. I did a um, I did a study and a presentation on this particular subject. Uh, even though one of my professor he said that uh, yes, this is the research, but you pick one of the researchers with inconclusive data. What do you mean inconclusive data? When it comes to research, at um, at the end of the research, there's al always there's always advantages and disadvantages. So, but I found a lot of research that shows a lot of advantages on omega three with the proven uh, with the proven results, and another with. So it just depends. You have to look at the science, and you have to accept everything uh, from the research. And so that's why I'm that's why I had to bring this up to say that uh, by taking omega-3 pills by the way as a supplement might not might not reflect on your health at all by having actual foods may actually help you why because not only foods have those omega-3s they also have some other zoo nutrients remember in the first lecture we talked about uh, zoo nutrients those uh, health promoting substances that can make you healthy and through processing we lose them so by consuming uh, less processed foods uh, we have those zoo nutrients or plant uh, or uh, or phytochemicals that are coming from plants if the product is not processed right so but right now we're talking about the PUFAS uh, omega-3 and if you look on another side on the opposite side right omega-6 they also are important but they look look where they're coming from meat eggs which is good brain mm, how often do you eat brain I've tried it once uh, uh, trace amounts uh, animal products uh, hemp oil hemp oil is good uh, evening uh, corn oil, safflower oil, yeah, good products, good oils, yeah, meat. But what happens that our body, our body makes certain regulatory molecules out of either omega-3 or out of either omega-6. So those regulatory molecules, and we already know that omega-6 increases blood pressure. We need to increase blood pressure if the blood pressure drops. So we need those regulatory molecules and it constricts blood vessel and omega-3 decreases blood pressure. If your blood pressure is increased, your body needs to have a regulatory molecules that can decrease blood pressure, right? And it just happened, it just happens, not happened, it just happens that all the processed foods are made from these products and you adding more on those regulatory molecules that can increase your blood pressure and constrict your blood vessels. So because most of the processed foods are not made out of these products, right? They mostly made out of these products. And I will show you a slide which coming uh, next visually, right? But I just wanted to show you here as well. So you see they elongated, but we need them both. Please, um, please remember that we need them both. Um, and again, like let's say, like, let's look at omega three, right? Uh, canola, soybean, flaxseed. Flaxseed is over advertised. There is good one. Soybean, pff, I, w I wouldn't. Uh, I would stick with flax seeds because soy uh, there's a lot of um, um, genetically modified soy right now on the market. Uh, Ecosapentanoic or docosapentanoic, EPA, EPA and DHA, uh, if you start watching TV commercials, you will probably hear a lot. So these are the mega three, marine algae, fish oils, animal fats as phospholipid component, fish oil, but animal fats, it could be both. It could be actual animal or it could be uh, fish, which is kind of an animal as well, right? Uh, so that's 
why omega-3 is better just because the regulatory molecules that are made from these products are anti-inflammatory and that's what I didn't mention here I said increased blood pressure constrict blood vessels decrease blood pressure dilates blood pressure we need both but now let's look at inflammation so omega-3 versus omega-6 ratio Eskimos, we know that Eskimos, they have 4 to 1 ratio. Yes, they're kind of healthy. Paleo men, the caveman, used to have 1 to 1 ratio of those fats. So it was normal, right? Because there was no processed foods. And then the year 1939, we start increasing, 85, 1 to 12. And mother men, marine omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Mother men, even though it's one, uh, 1 to 20 or 1 to 150, 1 to 150 truly truly i do not remember where i get this information from this particular image so it could be whatever who created whatever but today's ratio what i know from the reputable source is 1 to 60. i probably just because it's a science course i probably should have put, uh, put a link towards uh towards that particular uh reference but trust me so it is 1 to 60 let's forget these numbers so if on this side on the right side your body is making those regulatory molecules that includes in, in increases blood pressure uh, constricts blood vessels and are pro in inflammatory they are more dangerous right because there's more of them and they bring up the fire and on another on the opposite side anti-inflammatory and the one that decreases are coming from omega-3 so even if you're a healthy person and you're sitting on the couch and you're doing nothing and you are in, pro in, in pro-inflammatory state the omega-3 cannot fight this battle right because it is like more soldiers on one side that are actually constricting blood vessels increasing blood pressure they pro-inflammatory they uh, activate the immune system they bring uh, white blood cells they bring everything to fight something and there's nothing to fight you have nothing you have no disease but those cells uh, especially immune cells they will start destroying your tissue that uh, there is a, there is around there where the immune cells are so it is almost impossible to fight that so let's look at omega-6 causes diabetes arthritis rheumatoid arthritis cardiovascular disease gluten intolerance celiac disease just because those molecules um, regulatory molecules are made out of these foods if your diet would be one to one it would be perfect balance we need the balance right we need the homeostasis anti and pro it just happened that processed foods for one reason just because it's cheaper maybe are made from these products and maybe they're more shelf stable because they have less of double bonds and these are fish right most of fish has more than two double bonds right three double bonds they are more oily so they can leak out more in a warmer temperature not in the cold temperature more in the warmer temperature so they less shelf stable so that's another factor you can include that here so that's why omega-3 is a lot healthier today today than omega-6 and to get more of omega-3 it's not the supplements that will help you you cannot over supplement yourself and still fight again 160 it's impossible all you have to do is just cut down on the supply if you will cut down on supply then you can help yourself with the supplements and with the actual food but no, no, we do not really have, like, do you really consume flax seeds, salmon oil, flax seeds, cod liver? Who eats cod liver? I do. But when you open the cod liver, it looks like it's a brain. Like, you open up the can, it looks like it's brain. When you start eating, it's like, yeah, texture. I would rather have something from this side, right? So, um, anchovies, tuna, yeah, tuna we eat, but usually tuna is albacore, and the albacore has a lot of mercury, and you're supposed to eat tuna, there is albacore tuna, and that's usually what you find on the shelves in, in the store, and it's been shown through the research that you cannot eat more of uh, tuna albacore more than once per month, so, 
right? So uh, when you go to a subway and you get a hero or half of that, right, six inches, and you put the tuna, that's your monthly value of the tuna. Stop eating tuna because there's mercury. And, right, so uh, you, you see the problem today, right? So I think that I've said it enough on, uh, on omega-3 and omega-6. So what you need to memorize for the omega-3 and omega-6, that omega versus omega, right? So let me fix it, right? So I, I will fix it later. So omega-3 versus omega-6. So omega-3 is uh, anti-inflammatory, regulates inflammation, uh, decreases blood pressure, and dilates, dilates blood vessels. And omega-6 is pro inflammatory this is anti memorize this please uh coagulates blood makes blood thicker which is we need it because otherwise we could bleed to death if the blood would be too thin but then again it's 1 to 60 at least uh, so it's pro-inflammatory increases blood pressure and it is constricts constricts blood vessels that can lead to atherosclerotic uh, plaques that can lead to a heart attack and that can lead to a stroke if there is a atherosclerotic plaque is already there but the atherosclerotic plaque would be probably due to free fatty acids that will create and will get oxidized in the blood vessels we will talk about actually the process of atherosclerosis today i think i've said it enough on omega-3 and omega-6 uh, this is just a repeat. You can look at this as well. On this side is just a mega from the right. On the other images was a mega from the left. Not important. So, and in one research, it shows that the mega three uh, and our this is our um, the lipid bilayer uh, around our three lens of cells also also part of our our. BC red blood cells. If there's more of omega-3, then the cells are more flexible. So a measure of the amount of EPA and DHA, which is omega-3, in the red blood cell membrane, phospholipids, expressed as a percentage of total fatty acids. There are 64 fatty acids in this model uh, membrane, three of which is EPA and DHA. So 3 over 46, uh, 64, I'm sorry, will give us an index of 4.6. So this index 4.6 indicates that it is a uh, healthier than the lower index. So only 3 omega-6 per, per, this, per, um, per this volume, right, per this size. So if there are 3 here, and more, 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 more. Right? But then again, it is coming from the research that there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages of that research. Uh, but uh, I've seen some other research on omega-3. So it is not the omega-3 supply or supplements or the foods that you need to eat. There is no way you can fight it off 1 over 60. It is the actual cut down on the supply of omega-3 which comes mostly from processed foods if you cut down on the processed foods you will bring yourself to the ratio of at least one to four because we still eat processed food chocolates candies and other uh, and other things i do eat so i think that i cut down a lot on the processed food supplies most of the foods that i consume are homemade um all right so Let's look at the structure. So even though this is a, um, all these following, following images are basically general knowledge, general knowledge, let's look at this process. Pretty simple, right? Resolvents. What are the resol uh, resolvents? And they on the side of, you see, EPA and DHA. So they on the side of omega-3 and omega-6. Just for today, omega-3 is great. 100 years ago, maybe both of them were great, right? Again, I repeat myself. We need them both for control of blood pressure, up a higher bl blood pressure or the lower bl blood pressure. So the resolvents uh, derived from uh, omega-3 uh, primary carcinoids, they block the production of pro-inflammatory mediators. And the mediators are prostaglandin, prostaglandins and... Uh, and um, 
and uh, and leukocytes, uh, um, white blood cells, because the white blood cells can actually hypen or even initiate the inflammatory reaction that can actually could be dangerous, even though they help us, but they could be dangerous if it's too many of them at the particular site where they're trying to inoculate uh, the pathogen or kill the bacteria or the virus so they can create more damage as well. So the resolvents, they actually um, regulate leukocytes, uh, LTs, uh, trafficking to inflammatory sites. They can kind of hamping or they can kind of slow it down. So they also can clear neutrophils from mucosal surface. So the neutrophils are phago, phagocytes that basically come here, uh, come to the site of the injury, and they start uh, digesting the debris or digesting the pathogens and releasing the waste. And there's even more of cytokine storm. So I'm just getting into other uh, part of, uh, of science that not important, but I just want to strengthen this information. So, right, so that's on the resolvents. So let's look on prostaglandins. So the pro prostaglandins, they made at the site of the damage or the injury. So they are involved in inflammatory reaction, which is normal, which is, that's what we needed. We need inflammatory reaction. If there's an injury, otherwise, if we wouldn't have this inflammatory response, uh, we could die. So we need this inflammatory response. However, it's 60 to 1, and obviously, we do not need too much of it. So the resolvents on another side, right, they protect, they kind of slow it down because we need it, right? If there is a fire, fire, we need something to stop that. And if it's 1 to 1, it is a perfect ratio and we can stop it. Um, so the prostaglandins, they control plus process of inflammation, which is normal process during injury. We need them. Uh, blood flow, right? We need to bring more blood to the site of injury so we can remove waste. We can bring nutrients, oxygen, remove carbon dioxide-ish. Formation of blood clots, they bring platelets. And induction of labor, which is not part of that, but we need them as well. And they made out of omega-6. Um, fatty acids because fatty acids we need them for structural purposes and another leukotrin um, a trigger contraction the smooth muscle lining and bronch uh, bronchioles contraction in the smooth muscles so uh, the major cause of inflammation in asthma and allergic uh, rhinitis we also need them but maybe not to the certain extent, maybe not too much of them. Because when they are in this tissue, they are protecting those tissues. But if it's too many of them, that is the overcome. They, it's overkill, I'm sorry, that is an overkill. So resolvents today are better than prostaglandins and leukotrienes, right? So I, I think that I've said it more than enough on omega-3. So we really look at that. So I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna skip this. All right, so <clears throat> optimal lipid nutrition during infancy. Some fatty acids are conditionally essential. Conditionally essential during infancy. Remember we talked about conditionally essential molecules like proteins or fatty acids. Why are they conditionally essential? Because when this a condition during infancy at the growth stage, uh, those particular molecules are important. And if the condition is gone, they're not important as much because your body is either to uh, make certain molecules that were not be uh, that were not able to make them before, or um, your body already used them up and made a certain tissue, and you grew out of that, and you do not need them anymore, right? Or that tissue is already built. You, you're already at a certain stage that you are developed. So, and uh, especially um, conditional essentials, fatty acids during infancy are important for a mental growth stage. So growth, development of eyes, nervous system, and the red, right? I'm the red, I put it on purpose. So for mental function. So human milk, human milk, at least 47 different fatty acids in human milk that do not appear in formula. 
So those zoo nutrients, zoo, yeah, mm. zoo chemicals or zoo nutrients that are coming from a mother has those uh, particular nutrients, right? Has those chemicals, but through processing in the formula. It is impossible to synthesize them. It is impossible to make them from scratch because they're so small, those particles. So babies are missing out on those almost 50 very important uh, molecules that need them for growth, for the development, for the mental functionality. Babies do not have specific enzymes to make these fatty acids. So that's why... Uh, certain fatty acids like omega-3 are very essential during this growth stage. So there are two types of fat, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So the visceral fat surrounds vital organs. This is the visceral fat surrounds vital organs, the, which is more dangerous than subcutaneous fat that is just under your skin to keep you warm, shock absorption. Um, so fatty cells or fat cells, fat cells, uh, we call them adipose, adipose tissue or adipocytes, adipocytes. So during digestion, we need insulin. Remember in the previous lectures, in the carbohydrate lecture, in the digestive system lecture, we talked about the insulin. Insulin is a storage hormone. Not only insulin stores uh, carbohydrates, uh, may, uh, um, initiates synthesis of glycogen, also participates in the synthesis of amino acids to proteins, also important for uh, stimulating of lipo, genesis like glucogenesis or glycogenesis not glucogenesis i'm sorry like glycogenesis making glycogen but also lipogenesis storing fat in the fat cells so that's the lipogenesis so lipogenesis and triglyceride storage why because we have free fatty acids that will be stored in the form of triglycerides remember this I'm still, I still have this. So all this process that goes towards this way, I'm going to put it in another color right now in blue. So this, this, right? Not, not sugar from here, right? To store fat, it is a call lipogenesis. Uh, But they're lipogenesis, right? But um, that's when we're storing. But the opposite, right? The opposite reaction uh, would be what? To break down fat back into the free fatty acid, it would be lipolysis or lipolysis. The way I'm saying lipolysis to actually indicate there's lipo fat and lysis is splitting. So lipolysis breaking down. So when we are digesting food, it is kind of ish lipolysis as well, ish. I said ish, I don't want to get in there. So that's what it's important. So the insulin is the storage hormone. So the insulin stimulates adipocytes and skeletal muscles to take up glucose and fatty acids. So too much of insulin when we are consuming processed foods, uh, your blood glucose is too high, let's say, right? And you're consuming processed foods, the in insulin will can stimulate adipocytes and skeletal muscles to take um, not only glucose, but also fatty acids. So you will release more insulin and insulin might be part of the problem that will convert, not the actual insulin conversion, but will participate in the pathways that will will, uh, will be related into storage of more of fatty acids rather than use them for something structured or energy directly that would be stored um, in the deeper sides. However, what's important, it is the length of fatty acids also um, 
has a relation to uh, storage of the fatty acids. Remember, short chain fatty acids, medium chain triglycerides, mostly will be used for energy, but the longer chain fatty acids would be stored as uh, as fat, as triglycerides. So this is a cell membrane or lipid bilayer. So this is the cell, right? And that's the border of the cell. So you can look at the cell as like a bowl, but obviously cells in human body, they have different shapes. They have different function. Um, so this is the lipid bilayer made of one layer and made of another layer. So these fatty acids are called phosphor. Phos for lipids so these fatty acids are phospholipids so they have two tails those two fatty acids so and you see the arrangements you see the way they are pointing uh, one towards another so the fatty acids pointed one towards another because this side is gonna be hydrophobic hydrophobic they are free of water the opposite sides right this side is inside inside that's where the water is and the opposite side the outside also the water is right because the solution water is outside in interstitial space outside of the cell and inside of the cells intracellular uh, liquid inside of the cell also has water so this hydrophilic sites hydrophilic head of phospholipids uh, polarity polar nonpolar right fatty acids are nonpolar not important not chemistry so what's important to understand that the lipid membranes of trillions of trillions of cells like 37 40 50 60 you can find different number in different textbooks so made out of phospholipids so you can see how fatty uh, like how lipids are important in in our um, in our health so also you can see cholesterol right so um, these are the sugars um, it's like antennas like receptors regulatory molecules as well so we need cholesterol also as the ligands um, also regulatory molecules so um, there's uh, fatty acids are everywhere so it's not the fat that we consume is dangerous it's basically the fat that we are produced that is more dangerous we will look at that next um, so this is the phospholipid with the two fatty acids and you see one is saturated fat and another is um, is unsaturated fats and when we're consuming animal products uh, we are getting that because and plant products because cells in plants and cells in animal they have phospholipids so we are consuming a lot of phospholipids so but the phospholipids by themselves they play a role in digestion absorption transports of lipids how because they are part of the cell membrane right so for example certain fats need to be uh transported in uh, in blood let's say and the cells that would be made to transport other fats uh, will have phospholipids. You will see how it's done. Cellular metabolism found, natu found in natu naturally in cell membranes, animals, and plants. Uh, Phosphate-containing polar group, not important. So what's important here, it is that uh, phospholipids are amphipathic. What is amphipathic? Like amphibian man, right? Can live on the water, under the water, and on, on the land. So amphipathic contains both, both sides, right? This side has uh, phospho, I mean hydrophilic, and the opposite side is hydrophobic. Polar head group and fatty acids. Um, that's that's what it is. That's how it's arranged on paper. And again, also glycerol molecule, also ester linkage, and then there are actual fatty acids. Cell membrane, phospholipids, and such and such. So let's look at a um, sterols and stanols. This is very interesting. We have a few more 20 slides to go. Um, right, sterols and stanols. Cholesterol, found in animal foods and made in the body. That's what is more dangerous when it's made in the body. 
made from glucose and fatty acids. That's interesting. So when you're consuming a lot of processed foods and has a glucose, it's like a more supply to make more uh, cholesterol. It's like your liver want to use this glucose, convert it into cholesterol, and then throw this cholesterol out of the liver, and whatever the cholesterol will go, your liver doesn't really care. But this is a very simple kind of explanation that maybe not very scientific, but I just uh, skipped on 100 steps, right? So cholesterol naturally not found in animal products. So if you go in the store and there are two products, um, let's say bread, loaf of bread, one says nothing, right, just bread, and it costs one dollar, and another says free of cholesterol, and it says five dollars. You're like, wow, it's free of cholesterol, let me get it, let me pay more because it's healthier. Naturally, Plant products does not have cholesterol. They have something else, but not their actual cholesterol. So this is just a label, and they're allowed to say that because it is actually free of cholesterol. There's no cholesterol. So those gimmicks are done by the producers just to make us more stupid and to buy their products. So cholesterol, why do we need cholesterol? How your body utilizes cholesterol that is part of the animal products? I can create bile acids. Why do we need bile? Remember, we need bile for emulsification of fats. Bile is made by liver, stored in the gallbladder. Gallbladder during digestion really... I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to cut it out, but it's too long. Real life lecture. Oh, and just because we're in real live lecture, uh, on the first lecture when I recorded, I think it was a digestive system, or it was second lecture, I think in, in, uh, in a digestive system lecture, I was talking about something and then I had the cramp and I went under the table. And I was like, cramp, 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 I couldn't find it. If you can't find it and you remember what it, uh, what it was, just please uh, tell me which minute or second it was. I want to cut it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I will dump it on my YouTube channel. It's interesting. Uh, we can have a laugh, please. Uh, <clears throat> all right. I think it was digestive system or it was even the first lecture. I think it was digestive system. All right. It was a two-minute break. All right, so cholesterol, so we need, uh, we, uh, we need cholesterol to synthesize bile acids, to emulsify fat, to uh, break down big, big fat globules, big fat globules into smaller fat globules, so your body would, uh, it would be easier for enzymes, lipases, to get in and start uh, breaking down fats so we can absorb them. Uh, they part, cholesterol, also part of the cell membrane, as you see here, part of the cell membrane. And also we need cholesterol to make steroid hormones. Hormones are regulatory molecules. They can upregulate the process or they can downregulate process. It is like a red light, stop, a green light, go, make, do something. So now... Let's look at the phytosterol. You see the sterile and the sterile. So there's a cholesterol, which is the animal, and there's a phyto plant. Remember, plants are phytosterols. So the phytosterol referred to as plant sterol and stenol esters. Sterol and stenol. But if you just say st just say sterol, I might think, well, you're talking about the cholesterol. But you have to say plant sterol or stenol, n, and no, then it is, I know that it's plant. Group of naturally occurring compounds found in plant cell membranes. Let's look here, stenols and sterols. So this is cholesterol, animal, and this is a plant. So this double bond, this double bond represents, forget about those double bonds uh, in, in the plant oil. So this double bond pointing out that this sterol is the animal product and the stenol uh, that is a plant cholesterol doesn't have the double bond and it is actually a plant product. We will not concentrate on that. Obviously, it's not organic chemistry. So that's why I want to skip on it, not to create any confusion. 
but cholesterol is animal and plant sterol and plant stenols are coming from plant products so why it is important for our health i will explain how you can lower your cholesterol so phytosteroids are similar to cholesterol phytosteroids so there's a uh, hormones or there's even drugs or there's some not supplements but drugs that are made by pharma that can lower cholesterol and how i will explain it so the stenols are saturated sterols having no double bond stenols you see right so i'm right actually i'm right having no double bond in the sterol ring structures so if there's a double bond then there's a cholesterol if there's no double bond there is a stenol which is different from uh, triglycerides but i will never ask you that so i wanted to point out something so let's say you having a diet let me come back here so let's say you have a diet right so you're eating animal products that have cholesterol and you eating a plant that has a uh, phytosterols or stenols right and let's say you have a cell that and that's the entry right channels that will accept that so there are two types of drugs so they can basically block uh, this entry of cholesterol kind of blocking so when you're eating cholesterol they just block the absorption of cholesterol but we need cholesterol so they give you a little bit uh on milligrams whatever i'm not really sure how much they uh, they give you that so you can absorb some of the cholesterol because we need cholesterol structural purposes and some other stuff but it will be malabsorbed so if your body cannot accept it if this is blocked so this cholesterol like kind of like i will exaggerate like bounce off and boo, 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 and it is a waste right so you eat your animal products your meats your even fish right so eggs uh dairy products so the cholesterol is uh unabsorbed but the phytosterol and the animal sterile they almost identical right it's just the difference between this double bond so they almost identical it's like a key and a lock you have a key you're trying to get in somewhere and it's like you picking 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 ah yes i was able to open that up so drugs is one way just physically block this entry so maybe plant can get in because someone on that uh, differences but the animal cannot and another type of uh let's say another way to lower your cholesterol it is more natural which has nothing to do with drugs so when you're consuming animal products together with plant products like let's say steak plus salad guess what just because they are pretty similar they will compete for absorption because they're similar and when they when they will compete for absorption only half of the plants will be absorbed and half of the animal will be absorbed how half and half i'm saying this i'm again i'm exaggerating just because on the it's by chance in science it's chance so let's say you have 100 percent of molecules on uh, on animal cholesterol and 100 percent of molecules on the plant cholesterol so just because they're trying to go through one door it's like you have blue and yellow uh dressed people going through one door by chance it's going to be half and half it's going to be five or like you have a bowl and that's actually what we did what was interesting test um we did it in bio class long time ago so there's marbles it was like red and white marbles so you stick your hand and you're putting those uh, pulling those marbles and it's like six people over the table and you start pulling them and by chance we still were able to pull 50 50. it's like flipping a coin so let's say you will only absorb 50 and only absorb 50 right so you already that way that way you're already cutting out on half of the plant i mean on half of the animal cholesterol that is more dangerous than the plant sterile or stenol also if you remember fiber that is present in the plant products 
are able or the fiber or other uh, other um, other molecules like cholesterol like let me slow down let's do this again fiber is able to or let's say sugar uh minerals maybe some vitamins they are able to or they are attached to the fiber particles in plant products so when we're consuming fiber and we discussed this in one of the lectures on carbohydrates so you do not really absorb most of the sugars on some of the minerals we could lose uh, and some of the vitamins just because those molecules they're attached to the uh, to the fiber uh, particles so that way you will absorb also let's say half also you will absorb less of that right I hope I didn't confuse you so but in this principle it's just a competition competition for the absorption so yeah I was right on this thing um, so the fat digestion let's re revisit that from digestive system so in the mouth we have lingual lipase or salivary lipase in the stomach there's gastric lipase stimulated by the gastrin not important for this class and in small intestine there's a pancreatic lipase also stimulated by it remember we talked about CCK I can cut it out that not that mm -hmm. yeah it is stimulated by pancreatic uh, it's stimulated by CCK because pancreatic lipase is remember it is a we called it pancreatic enzymes or pancreatic juices and we need pancreatic enzymes to break down carbohydrates proteins and fats to break down fat we need pancreatic lipase which is the part of pancreatic enzymes and CCK stimulates pancreas and the pancreas releases pancreatic lipase amylase and uh, trypsin the proteases so it is stimulated by CCK so digestion of fats begins in the mouth by the lingual lipase from the salivary glands in the stomach gastric lipase small intestine bile again bile we need to emulsify fats to break down big fat globules into the smaller fat globules absorbed through the intestine alveoli in the small intestine uh, remember those finger-like projections so short chain fatty acids this is important because this you should know that already uh, because yes you did to, you did to took the first test so small chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids or medium chain triglycerides but fatty acids would be more correctly because it could be combination different fats are carried to the liver so what does that mean is that long chain fatty acids will not go to liver on the first cycle they will be packed into this, into the specialized uh, lipoproteins chylo micron micron it is a lipoprotein think of that as a bus right just because they're long fats or long chain fatty acids they are hydrophobic so they cannot get into the blood only small chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids can get into the blood they kind of wish hydrophilically uh, molecules so they will get into the blood and from the blood everything gets into the liver liver is like the every road leads to Rome liver is like a post office repackaging center gets everything makes packages remodels uh, remodels everything makes packages and sends it out so small and medium will get into the blood and then from the blood they will arrive to liver but long chain fatty acids they will be packaged in the chylomicrons which is next and then will be like a bus right and then will be uh, and that then they will end up in the lymphatic system and through one circulation only then they will probably end up in the blood and then from blood they will be delivered to liver and this 
chylomicron will unpack and those small chain, a long chain fatty acids will get out into the liver. And liver will do the similar process with this small chains and fatty, uh, small chains fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids. So this was like an introduction of what we're gonna go through right now. Uh, this is kind of more complex digestion or absorption, but I wanted to show you that, look, um, you see, in the mouth, triglycerides, right, when we're absorbing in the mouth, digestion through the link or lipase um, that is produced by salivary glands. So the free fatty acids, you see, it used to be three, right? And now, boom, it's two because one was just released. Uh, then when it gets into the gastric region, which is your stomach, now it, is, it removes another one. And bile, pancreatic lipase. Right, right. So it removes another one. And then you see OH, OH. So the fatty acid is, is not here anymore. So loses one here, loses another here. And then in the, in the small intestine, it arrives with only one fatty acid. So it looks like that it was three then it was two, and then it's one. And then it's been completely digested. So it is partial digestion through all of those three phases. Um, mulsification, again, part, right? Once it uh, arrives into the small intestine, uh, that's when there is a uh, emulsification of big fat globules into the small fat globules. It is a, what is it called? Um, it's a disbursement. So it, uh, the, the big fat globules being like dispersed, so uh, uh, is being broken down into smaller fats, into smaller fatty acids. Not smaller fatty acids, I'm sorry, into smaller fat globules. From big fat globules into the smaller fat globules. Um, you can see that I'm already starting stumbling because I'm sitting in a warm room because the window is closed. Uh, I have two lights shining on me and, um, and it is warm here and it is already almost two hours and that's what the lecture is about. And I'm not standing, I probably should have been standing than sitting. Next time I will be standing. All right, so digestion of the dietary lipids. So let's look at that. In the digestive system, when we had the lecture, we just basically brushed over that, right? Three stages, three phases. And you already know a lot, right? So in the small intestine, so let's bypass uh, oral cavity, uh, the gastric region. So we're already in the small intestine. So there's a mycelles and there are chylomicrons. I don't see them here. So the release of cholecytokinin or CCK, we need it, right? So what does the cholecytokinin do? do? So yeah, it would be better to jump here. So we have our liver and we have our gallbladder and we have pancreas, right? So you remember that. So hormone CCK, I have three C, four C's, CCK acts on gallbladder, right? And I forgot to create a uh, small intestine. So, and here's the stomach, right? Small intestine. So the CCK acts on gallbladder and gallbladder in response releases bile, releases bile. Why? Yeah, time. Releases bile. Also, CCK acts on pancreas, and pancreas, in response, uh, releases a um, pancreatic enzymes. And just because we're talking about fat, it releases lipase. And this lipase arrives here. So the bile emulsifies, breaks down big fat, big fat globules into the small fat globules and lipases finishes this digestion. So this is the CCK job, right? It's a reminder. Um, 
And this is complete a triglyceride uh, digestion, micelle formation. So we're gonna look at the micelles. Should I look here? Right. So this basically, when we are digesting fats, we can get those fats in a variety of form. Free fatty acids, monoglycerides, diglycerides, triglycerides, bile acids, phospholipids, cholesterol, cholesterol ester, varieties of forms. Some of them could be directly be absorbed into the blood and transported directly to liver, and some of them needs to be packaged. Otherwise, they will not be able to be transported into the blood. And the blood is the highway that takes up uh, um, molecules and delivers them to liver or to other parts of your body. So you see there's like varieties of fats and then there is a mycelial formation. So these mycelials are like also buses, buses that packages all these fats and transport them. So the transporter, transport them, smiley face. Um, <clears throat> so this is the process. I probably should have put uh, that um, here, this logo that this is just a general information. I wanted to show you, but you've seen this before. So this is just a glass and the fats, right? If you have that uh, drop of oil in the glass of water, whatever. So the fat would be like suspended, like suspension, right? It would be suspended and the water molecules, right? H2O, so basically hydrogens and oxygens, they are suspended and they will be surrounded, not not these molecules, they will, be, they will surround this, a phospholipid membrane. And the emulsification or emulsifier that bile basically breaks down these big fat globules into the smaller, it's like washing your hands, or when you like start dispersing, like you have a drop of oil in the bottle of water and you start like doing that, like creating agitation. And uh, through that agitation, you're able to break them down into the smaller fat globules because uh, let's say we say emulsifier, it's, it's like a soap, so it pulls out grease together with warm water uh, out of your hands. And now you probably understand why it is warm water, because of warm water makes fats more liquid. And the liquid, right, it is easier to pull out of a certain type of structures. And um, remember, butter at the room temperature is solid. So try to put your hands in the butter and if it's not and, and put it under the cold water right it is really hard to take it out so you need to convert that solid material into the more liquid material so then it's easier to take uh, the grease off so let's look at the micelles so you see like uh, short chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids right so they are absorbed directly into the blood because they're short medium and they kind of uh, less hydrophobic, more hydrophilic, and they will be absorbed through the enterocytes of our small intestine into the blood, and from the blood they will get into the liver. However, some other fats that cannot go through the same pathway, so they will be packaged into the micelles, into these micelles, so long chain fatty acids, cholesterol, some long mono, uh, monoglycerides packaged into the micelles and taken only then taken into a uh, enterocytes. They cannot even get into the enterocytes. And um, and some other types of fats, triglycerides, phospholipids, cholesterol, as are uh, reform and such and such, and they packed in the chylomicrons and another type of a transporter. So this type of this type of transporter, chylomicrons, are also like a bus, right? packs all those fatty acids and, oh, it's a cool car, packs fatty acids and puts them into the uh, lymphatic system. It bypasses the blood. So all those fatty acids that are here, they will end up in the liver, but first they will get into the lymphatic system and through the lymphatic system, like on a few cycles, only then it will be uh, delivered. So this uh, kind of micron will end up in the little blood and then will end up in, uh, in the liver. So our circulatory system blood is the circular, that's why it's been called circulatory system. Like let's say actually, 
yeah let me actually show you that so you will have the full uh, picture um, even though it's not part but so let's say it's hard right with chambers right so this aorta and from the aorta we get into the system we get into the system and then from the system we our body is able to deliver nutrients oxygen and then uh, the venal system or venous system right will come back into the heart so it is a circulatory system so the lymphatic system runs in parallel by parallel i mean it goes only one direction so it only goes one direction so the lymphatic system is like a sewage or like a by saying sewage it has uh it has a lot of immune cells so it, it is very important but it is like a service road so what happens the lymphatic system picks up whatever was left over from the delivery of the nutrients let's say some nutrients were supposed to be delivered to the cell let's say right it was was supposed to be delivered to the cell but there's like leftovers because of the pressure high blood pressure so not all of the nutrients end up in the cell so and something are left here so they will end up they will be sucked in back into the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system is only one way it goes into the subclavicle in our left subclavicle and will those nutrients will be delivered like for example proteins your body wants to deliver protein into the cell but the proteins were left over somewhere here they, they just end up in interstitial space but the lymphatic system picked them up like a service road right and then deliver them into a um into the blood because under the subclavicle vein over there so your body is able to connect back into the into a circulatory system so the lymphatic system is one way road and uh, arteries and veins are circulatory because the nutrient would be let's say if the nutrient is not absorbed or doesn't go into waste it will be constantly circulating 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 so that's the work of the chylomicrons so and this is a chylomicron so it's called lipoprotein but lipoprotein is just a general name because there's there's a lot of lipoprotein so in the particular lip, lip, lipoprotein called chylomicron you see all these types of fats are packaged into the chylomicron and border or the cell membrane of chylomicron are also made of phospholipids right so that's why we need a lot of them so we just the transporter so all those fats will be packed in there and then this lipoprotein will deliver it through the lymphatic system then circulation that will end up in the blood and only then will end up in the liver right um in blood in blood right so we said that they will be transported into the in in the blood kind of freely remember we talked about albumin protein albumin we talked about in uh, protein protein lecture so the albumin we need albumin as a transporters as a transport so albumin can transport fat soluble vitamins in the beginning of the lecture i actually mentioned that so albumin transports fat soluble vitamins and also albumin will be transporting small chain fatty acids and medium chain triglycerides even though they are kind of hydrophilically molecules but the albumin is needed to transport them uh in lymph chylomicrons will be circulated right so we already discussed that this is just a little not for our class because i don't want to get too deep into actual uh, i don't want to get there too deep so this is just for visual representation because we're gonna talk about lipoprotein so we already established that chylomicron is a lipoprotein it's a transporter you see it's very big and it transports mostly what triglycerides right chylomicron transports triglycerides because it is our triglycerides that we digesting through food you see yellow whatever this color triglycerides then vldl ideal but we're gonna concentrate on these two lipoproteins 
and these two lipoproteins are LDL that is being given a bad name, bad cholesterol, and HDL. It's good cholesterol. But both of them, we need them both uh, similar to similar to omega-3 and omega-6. We need them both. We definitely need them both. So why? Let me look at the chylomicron unless I'm forgetting something. A package transports through the bloodstream, uh, soluble in both water and oil. That's why the chylomicron uh, is a transporter because it's soluble in both, uh, in both in water and uh, in blood and in the lymph. Uh, because blood is hydrophilic and lymph is both-ish, I guess, hydrophobic. Through lymph transporter transports fats and there's some, so lymph probably both. Triglycerides coated with protein, cholesterol, and phospholipids. Chylomicron is a type of package. So just this. Chylomicron is a type of uh, package. So the package meaning it's like a bus. I call it a bus. You can call it a package. So you can call it anything because package transports something inside of the package and the bus transports, right? Because there's something inside of the bus. So those fats. So all this kind of, uh, right. All right. So let's stay on LDL and HDL. So what's wrong with LDL? We call it LDL is bad cholesterol. Why? Because that can lead to atherosclerosis. That can lead to plaque. That can lead to atherosclerosis in the heart arteries. This is a process of atherosclerosis. And that can lead to cardiovascular disease. Why and how? Plaque accumulates. So this is a plaque. So this is oxidized. oxidized fats, varieties of fats. So when they get oxidized, doesn't matter what, the, um, it doesn't really matter, the, the process of oxidation is not important. What happens in the healthy blood vessel, this inner first, inside of the lumen of the blood vessel, this inner first, uh, endothelial tissue gets damaged and the fats just because for example there is a lot of free fatty acids flowing in your system uh, for varieties of reasons you have type 2 diabetes uh, you are eating on a lot of processed foods and there's fatty acids circulates there um, even though there's a hydrophobic uh, they still could end up in blood so there's injury in the blood vessel in endothelial layer and those fats they will start getting inside so then they go through oxidative process they lose their integrity and your body will try to protect this damaged tissue by creating a plaque or creating a membrane around it you see the plaque is not here not inside of the lumen but the plaque is under this endothelial tissue under so by just accumulating over time let's say this is day zero and then accumulating over that it can take a decade actually and it starts creating a more fat because there's injury and your body starts encapsulated protects injury to separate compartments so there's a fibrous process fibers it's like callus basically callus formation so blah 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 and it creates occlusion so the blood vessels it's harder for the blood vessels to pass through this particular uh, site and then there's aggregation and that can lead to stroke that if it's in your uh, brain or it can lead to a heart attack if it's in your uh, um, heart artery so that's what can it lead to accumulation of uh, yeah, that's what it can lead to Plaque accumulates free fatty acids, cholesterol converted into the foam cells, cellular waste, uh, calcium, and other substances. So, not important. Just understand what the atherosclerosis is. It's the blockage, basically. Oxidized fatty acids, let's say LDL, doesn't matter. Oxidized, oxidized fat um, damages, or there's a damage into the, all right, one by one damage into the internal wall 
of the blood vessel, fats gets in there, they get oxidized, and over time there's more and more and more. Your body tries to prevent that, encapsulates that fat, uh, and that creates an occlusion. Occlusion prevents normal flow of the blood cells. And that occlusion can lead to heart attack or a stroke. That's it. So what can lead to that? Chronic inflammation. What is chronic inflammation? Your body in the stress, your body constantly thinks that there is something going on. So it can break down your adipocytes that triglyceride, triglyceride are stored there. It will think, oh, okay, you're in stress. You need more energy. Let me break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and send them wherever they need to go. They need to help you or, uh, to build something or to give you energy. And you're in stress for varieties of reasons. And all of a sudden, in your system, you have a lot of free fatty acids. So that can lead to that. Chronic inflammation. By consuming processed foods and having chronic inflammation of omega-6, your body would be thinking, well, there's something wrong because you are in pro-inflammatory state. You're sitting on the couch doing nothing and you think you're healthy, consuming those chips, processed foods, and watching TV and enjoying, but your body is in inflammation state. So that can lead to this process. So type 2 diabetes is a metabolical disorder and constantly inflammatory, chronic inflammatory state that can lead to release of stored triglycerides into the free fatty acids when it's not really needed. And omega-3 that is anti-inflammatory cannot fight it off because it is 1 to 60, let's say, ratio. So that uh, C-reactive protein, uh, that's the marker, I'm not gonna, uh, that can lead to heart disease, that can lead to stroke, the atherosclerotic plaques, and other complications. So that can lead to um, other complications, uh, uh, because I can go on, go on, and go on. So this is the atherosclerosis. So how do we deal with that? So physicians, they can do a angioplasty. So the angioplasty, they take a stand, this is a stand, and they feed the stand through the main artery, in uh, uh, through the thigh, and they feed it through the microscope, not the microscope, there's endoscope and probably at, uh, at the end of the stand, um, they feed it into the main artery. So let's say they can fit into here, right? So pretend that this is the artery, right? And this is the artery. This image just shows that it's a bypass, it's a graft, whatever. But pretend that this is a main artery, right? So they feed it here and they pull it, uh, they pull it stand and this balloon inflates and pushes on the wall of where there's a uh, atherosclerotic plaque and then cells, like red blood cells, it's easier for them to pass. I had a patient, she told me that she had 12 stents in her heart. I look at her, whatever, uh, I didn't look at her, the entire report, health report, I just looked whatever I had in my hands so I couldn't find all the information, but she told me that she had 12 stents. She was a really thin person because she said that she stopped uh, eating processed foods and such and such and such and such uh, that led her to this problem. So maybe there's possible uh, to have 12 stents. Uh, I'm not really sure. I didn't do any research on that, but I had a patient like that. So, um, right, so that's the angioplasty. And the bypass surgery, bypass surgery, so if this is, that's usually somehow this particular artery is damaged, usually with artery, with, uh, with artery scler uh, sclerotic plaques. So they remove this, they take an artery from your thigh again, like, or from, from some other part of the body, probably from the thigh-ish, right? So, and they create a bypass, like graft, so they just connected here and here and because for example there's no way you can put a stand here or maybe it is impossible to put a stand because if it's a, a, a lot of of uh, of the plaque here so when you start stretching your blood vessel it can rapture it can rapture the outside uh, of that epithelial tissue inside is endothelial and outside is epithelial so you can rapture that you can rapture that and it would be similar to aneurysm-ish, kind of. So, um, that's what it is. That's what is a uh, atherosclerosis. That's how we deal with that right now. 
uh, you cannot scrape this, right? You cannot scrape this out because it is underneath of this endothelial tissue. So through diet modification, diet uh, change of a, li uh, of a lifestyle, your diet lifestyle, you can prevent this accumulation. Not really sure if you can change your diet and you can you can get rid of that. If you're if you're changing your diet and your body, oh, okay, let me get rid of that. Not really sure actually. So the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, non modifiable Let's look look at modifiable. Smoke, right? You stop smoking, uh, you uh, prevent yourself from uh, having type 2 diabetes, less stressful, um, excessive alcohol, it is all modifiable, right? So you can modify that. Hypertension, again, to relax, stress, exercise, read. Um, I'm sure that studying for the test is kind of stressful. Uh, elevated blood lipids constantly, that type 2 diabetes can actually lead to that. Hyperlipidemia, that actually hypertension can lead to hyper... Actually, hyperlipidemia can lead to hypertension, that's the, uh, vice versa. Stress can lead to hyperlipidemia. Uh, excessive alcohol intake can lead to hyperlipidemia, and hyperlipidemia can lead to hypertension. So all that, smoking, diabetes, stress, excessive alcohol can lead to hyperlipidemia and hyperlipidemia can lead to hypertension and can lead to, uh, well, elevated blood lipids is hyperlipidemia. So I'm slowly getting to LDLs and HDLs. Antioxidants, fruits and vegetables uh, is, is another important modifiable factor if you include it there because antioxidants prevent oxidative stress. We will look at them in, uh, in mineral and vitamin lecture. The mineral is coming next week. Non-modifiable risk factors, you're born with them, right? Age, sex, genetics, prior stroke or heart attack. Prior stroke or heart attack could be... Uh, idiopathic, uh, meaning that without, it, it just happened, right? Um, low birth weight can uh, can lead to that, All right? So LDL and HDL. So let's look at the bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. But I do not really call it good and bad cholesterol, uh, but just to explain to someone. So basically. What is bad cholesterol? But then again, you see it's lipoprotein. Lipoprotein carries something. Look, look at this as a bus that transports something and it transports other fatty acids. So your liver, your liver makes LDL, packs it with different types of fats and sends it somewhere to uh, deliver those fatty acids for structural purposes. You see, look at the LDL. So what does the LDL stands for? Low density lipoprotein. Low density, it means that it will have more fats rather than proteins. Blue is a cholesterol. So you see LDL, when your liver packages LDL, it sends this LDL into the blood. Sends LDL into the blood. Because the LDL is needed because it has cholesterol, it has proteins, phospholipids, triglycerides for structural purposes to deliver to the tissue, to cells. So, but then it has a lot of cholesterol and it's not the cholesterol that we eat. It's the cholesterol that your body produces and, throw this, uh, and throws that away. You would think that we eat too much of cholesterol and that the liver needs to get rid of cholesterol. Yes, maybe in a general sense, but you have to eat a lot of cholesterol because cholesterol could be re. I don't want to get there. So it's uh, sugar, right? Sugar could be a source to make cholesterol. Maybe your liver makes a lot of cholesterol because there's a lot of sugar that coming in into your system. So instead of having too much of sugar that could be turned into fat, your body uses sugar and makes cholesterol. So um, I don't want to talk about that for now. So LDL, LDL has a lot of cholesterol and it's being sent to the blood for the delivery. And on the other hand, there is another molecule that is called HDL. You see, it's even smaller. It is a high-density lipoprotein. High-density meaning it means that it has more proteins than cholesterol. You see, protein, look 
it is a lot of protein that is not dangerous and look here on this side there's a lot of cholesterol there's more dangerous a little bit of protein some of the phospholipids and some of the triglycerides but the cholesterol could be dangerous here why we need cholesterol for structural purposes uh hormones steroid hormones regulatory molecules ligands uh, ligands that are um, that are the receptors on the cells so we need cholesterol but if it's too much of cholesterol being packed into many LDLs it's like buses going from A to point B delivering 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 so your body uh, will accumulate of those free fat right right so the ldl is being sent out into uh, into the blood and through blood it will be delivered wherever it needs to go all right so um let's look here so denser in fat than protein uh, carry cholesterol to heart arteries uh, correlates with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease excess LDL sticking to the walls of artery forming clocks uh, this is just in this type of language I wouldn't say that it's sticking to the wall so but there's the, the wall needs to be injured and only then that it gets there and it gets oxidized and then your body's trying to protect that structure and start encapsulating and pushing away right so and another side there is a high density lipoprotein made in the liver also uh, and I actually in small intestine as well contain but we're gonna look at the liver contain more protein than cholesterol which is good can remove cholesterol that's the key function can remove cholesterol from vessels that carry it back to liver correlates with decreased risk of cardiovascular disease how because it removes let's look at this that's a liver uh -huh. and that's a blood I want to have more like this that's a blood so liver eh? liver makes LDL and this LDL is being sent out so think of the LDL when the LDL is being transported right with bunch of fats especially with cholesterol and LDL actually called LDL cholesterol it's not just LDL it's LDL cholesterol so it's being sent out for purposes of delivering of those cholesterol other fatty acids to the tissue so think of a truck with the tart and there is a lot of packages and this truck goes on the highway and it is damaged highway it's like bouncing 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 and those fatty acids just falling off <laughs> so that, that's not that's kind of an analogy so and there's then there's like leftover some somewhere or or whenever the cholesterol has been delivered or the fatty acid has been delivered there's some leftovers and so this too too many of those leftovers can create an injury and then can create a plaque that creates a plaque and may create an occlusion so on the other hand we have a hero that's called hdl cholesterol so hdl is being sent by the liver into the blood vessels and what hdl does it picks up those leftovers and returns them back into the liver for reprocessing hdl that's why it's been called good cholesterol because it returns the leftovers into the liver however the problem is that when the hdl comes back liver destroys the HDL and repackages and changes it in another molecule so we're losing HDL so you might think that okay we need to consume more foods that can make more HDL no it doesn't work that way we need to eat less on foods that your body gets the supply and makes more cholesterol out of that so we need to cut on supply rather than increase somehow HDL so that way you can increase your HDL by cutting out on the supply so your body will produce less of cholesterol uh, 
So it is the cholesterol that we produce, not the cholesterol that we consume is more dangerous. So, oh, perfect. <laughs> so this is a um, analogy of that, right? So the liver makes, um, let's say there's a uh, LDL, whatever, I just skipped on that. It's like an intermediate step. So your liver makes LDL, sends it into the liver, I mean, into the, uh, into the blood vessels, and it's being delivered. We need it LDL. We need it for structural purposes. But HDL will remove the excess, right? Excess. Will remove excess cholesterol from the cells by saying from the cells. Not really sure if we will actually remove from the cells. And we'll return it back into um, into a liver. But HDL would be destroyed and would be converted into bile salts. So not important. Here's another image that shows that you see like LDL. Um, LDL is being part of leading to atherosclerosis. But the HDL comes here and removes it. Uh, this image does not really depict the actual process because HDL will not actually remove this particles that is already there M most likely um, not it's the leftovers there is in the blood flowing i don't think you will be able to remove it from there no um so that's basically this is basically the entire lecture but there's something else that i wanna uh, that i wanna mm, talked about when you give your blood, right, and you receive the, your results, on your lipid profile in your results, you have total cholesterol, you have LDL, you have HDL, and you have triglycerides. So that's what it means by total cholesterol. Total cholesterol will include your separate line of LDL, HDL, triglycerides. And that equals to total cholesterol. All right, so everything here is just an extra information so you can look at that this is the reference value for blood lipids like total cholesterol below 200 uh, ldl below 100 um, l um, hdl it is better to have above 60 uh, but try to have it not more than uh, not less than about 40 um, not less than 40 not less than 40 it is better to have it and triglycerides around um, around 150 so that's the total cholesterol so total cholesterol includes low high um ldls and triglycerides so you see it's desirable this is the optimal that's uh, high you people I, i've seen all i've seen 75 in the hospital um i've seen patients had like 80 i've seen patients had 80 uh, usually what I've seen people and when I ask them you know, what diet they are on and if they told me that they most on a plant diet they had to to have tend they had they tend to have higher HDL um, however too much of good cholesterol is also not a good thing because good cholesterol can remove that cholesterol that has been delivered and we need this delivered even this cholesterol is in blood that cholesterol needs to be somewhere right so it's too much of good cholesterol also bad um but the the ldl it's bad on my side actually and i have a uh, i'm uploading actually a video on youtube today i'm talking about fats i'm actually talking why i stopped eating meat uh, I I'm explaining why I stopped eating meats. Please watch that. It's very interesting. I think maybe uh, maybe it's going to be boring for someone. So um, my HDL usually is 35. Very kind of low, right? And and I and I know what to eat and how to eat. My total cholesterol is somewhere around this number, close, but slightly higher, slightly higher. My LDLs are slightly higher. My HDL I slight slightly lower, but my triglycerides are good. Go figure. However, uh, I have a problem on the genetic sides from my mother, so uh, she always had problems with uh, with fats. But my father is. He's perfect. He has type 2 diabetes, like 
latent stage, like third stage of diabetes. But when it comes to his lipid profile, he's like, right? So this is very interesting when it comes to fat. So what we look at, we do not really look at these numbers. The numbers by themselves, yeah, they're important. We look at the ratio. We look at the ratio of total cholesterol versus your HDL. So let's take a total cholesterol. Let's pretend I'm going to take like number 210 right, which is slightly higher, and HDL, let's say 35, which is low, right, 210 divided by 35, I will get number 6, so ratio would be 6, my ratio actually is 5.7, and this is the borderline of being on the good side and being on the bad side, what does it mean? So that the higher the, higher the ratio, the more possibilities that you might have atherosclerotic plaque, but taking that in consideration that I, on my side, I maybe have a genetic problem, you need to do tests on that. So that's why my lipid profile is fluctuating. It's never been good, never been good. And I, like if it's once a year I test it, uh, just because of the diet, no, I don't think so. Uh, so it's most, mostly, I would, I hope it's genetics. So that's the ratio. So how do you calculate ratio? You take your total cholesterol and you divide it by HDL and the ratio is more important than actually these numbers. So your total cholesterol, your ratio should be below 5.7-ish. Should be, the word is very, you see like should be. Um, one of my professors in undergrad, she was bragging actually, and she showed that she had ratio 2.8. She actually brought us, brought us her uh, blood test and she showed us 2.8. Uh, and I was like, wow, what do you eat? And she started explaining there's like plant and animal products, but then again, it's all maybe genetics. Um, so that's what it is. Um, and I love that professor. I loved. Uh, I love her. Uh, it's professor. Uh, sh she was actually my nutritional science professor. What I'm teaching right now. So uh, that this is the class she was teaching us. Professor uh, Professor uh, uh, Schnoll. Uh, if she will hear that, that would be perfect. But probably not. Uh, I will come out. Come up with questions. So I'm too tired already. So this is almost two hours, or probably two hours. All right. So I'm gonna sign out. Um, use bullet and watch this lecture. I will also cut it out or I will create separate separate share notes on certain processes that are kind of complicated. And I will also create uh, on the YouTube channel, I will create chapters. So when you go through the lecture, you can bring the mouse closer and, and the whole chapter will appear and you can jump, jump, jump. And I will create some separate uh, share notes for the study guides. All right, have a great day.